good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Erin Farley, and uh, we are going to go ahead and get started. So uh, just to introduce myself, um, for those of you who may uh, not be familiar, I am one of JRSA's research associates. Um, and uh, JRSA stands for the Justice Stati Research and Statistics Association. We are a national nonprofit organization dedicated to the use of research and analysis to inform criminal and juvenile justice decision making. And we are comprised of a network of researchers and practitioners which at the core include directors and staff from state statistical analysis centers. And before I welcome our presenter, I just wanted to remind those SAC attendees who are um, participating today that we have our upcoming Eastern Regional Training Institute um, in November. And so if you haven't registered uh, for that conference, please do so. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out um, to me and um, I will um, answer any questions. So with that, uh, it is my pleasure today to welcome you uh, to our webinar uh, that's titled Adding Geospatial Context to Big Data with RTM. Uh, and this will be presented by Joel Kaplan. He is an associate professor at Rutgers University uh, School of Criminal Justice and the deputy director of the Rutgers Center on Public Security, where he co-developed risk terrain modeling, RTM, uh, his applied research focuses on risk assessment, spatial analysis, and policing. So welcome, Joel. And uh, before we go any further, I do also want to take a moment to thank our partners at the Bureau of Justice Statistics for helping to make this webinar possible. And with that, I will hand it over to Joel. So welcome. Thank you very much, Erin. Can you hear me okay? I can, yes. All right, good. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you to JRSA for inviting me to do this and to Roger and Aaron and Jason for uh, the invitation and for making sure the technical issues were out of the way um, so that we can get started without any delay. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce you to risk train modeling and very various aspects of it. Um, please feel free to ask any questions if you, uh, if you have any along the way, but I did save time for questions towards the end. Um, basically, risk train modeling uh, offers us a structured framework for risk analysis that's place-based and actionable. The way that I'd like to begin introducing it is by asking you to consider a place where children repeatedly play. If we focus only on the kids, we would miss the presence of swings and slides and open fields. That is what we might define as a playground that attracts children to this location instead of other locations that are absent such entertaining qualities features of the landscape are influencing and enabling playful behavior. If we focus only on the kids, we would miss the presence of swings and slides and open fields. That is, what we might define as a playground that attracts children to this location instead of other locations that are absent such entertaining qualities. Features of the landscape are influencing and enabling playful behavior. Now, with this, with this in mind, um, we developed risk train modeling at Rutgers University to identify features of the environment that attract crime and to show how they interact with each other to aggravate crime risks. RTM was invented to identify basically unique behavior settings for crime. You could probably imagine that cliched dark alleyway when you think of this topic. And in this case, we're considering at least two attributes. That is an alleyway and poor lighting. Now, each of these factors might be risky, but we expect that the risk of crime is exceptionally high at places where these factors coexist. Risk train modeling does something similar, but in a more statistically robust way. It begins by testing a variety of environmental factors against event locations to measure their spatial influence. Valid factors are selected and then weighted to produce a final model that basically paints a picture of places where certain behaviors are statistically most likely to occur. For nearly a decade now, since risk train modeling was developed by Dr. Kennedy and I, we've been working with police agencies in the US and also around the world to test risk train modeling and to keep it grounded and practical to meet both the needs of police and the communities that they serve. Experiments funded by a variety of federal agencies have been conducted in multiple cities throughout the US. 
policing strategies that target high risk places have resulted in as much as 35% fewer, uh, fewer gun crimes, 33% fewer motor vehicle thefts, or 42% fewer robberies compared to control areas, among many other positive outcomes in all the jurisdictions studied. Focusing on risky places has been shown to really work to reduce and prevent violent and property crimes. Traditional crime analysis methods, such as hotspot mapping, for instance, assumes that crime doesn't move, that it will always occur in the future where it did in the past, even when police intervene. A heavy reliance on past crimes as the predictor of future crime is not sustainable, especially when the goal of policing is to have a measured impact on preventing crime altogether. Now, granted, it's very unlikely that any jurisdiction is gonna be 100% successful at preventing crime. Unfortunately, what tends to happen is that crime hotspots remain stable or resilient over time, despite the many foot patrols or arrests or citations and other traditional policing tactics that are utilized there. That's because hotspots tell you where crime is happening, but not necessarily why. They tell you where the problem is, but they don't consider the environmental factors that make these areas attractive and opportunistic in the first place. Hotspots are signs and symptoms of environments that are suitable for crime, but they offer very little insights for solutions to manage crime problems. Risk train modeling adds to this by providing a spatial diagnosis so that we can learn where to go, what to focus on when we get there, and why we are doing what we do. RTM helps us stop playing whack-a-mole so, so that we can focus our attention on the mechanisms that enable hotspots to emerge, persist, or desist. Now, risk train modeling was originally developed to solve a problem that many of us face. That is, how to leverage data and insights from various sources, and then to make that information actionable. With risk train modeling, we bring multiple sources of data together by connecting them to environments where people live, work, or behave the landscape, the environment becomes that common denominator. And it produces spatial risk assessments for crime and other types of problems that incorporate statistical methods as well as professional and practitioner experiences and insights about places and events in order to add context to this data, specifically spatial context. Data may be the new gold rush, but without context, it can be useless. So we all want to be empowered to make informed decisions, to solve problems, and to get the credit that we deserve for the success that we've achieved. The public demands that our actions be measured, that they be transparent and evidence-based, and that there be a utilization of resources that is sustainable, both financially, politically, and with regard to community relations. Risk trained modeling doesn't do all of this for you, but it does help to do it, but it does help you do a lot of it efficiently and effectively. So by using geographic places as the thread that weaves information together, risk trade modeling finds connections among data at shared places and times, and it identifies how the physical environment influences events resulting from human interactions at places. For example, within my field of study, I've seen firsthand how police agencies use risk train modeling to predict, prevent, and investigate all types of crimes, including violence, property crimes, gangs and organized criminals, drugs and overdoses, and even traffic crashes. For predictions, police use RTM to forecast high-risk locations and then deploy resources, such as police patrols. For prevention, Directed patrols coordinate with a variety of stakeholders to reduce crime at the high-risk places. And for the crimes that are not prevented, RTM is used by detectives to create geographic profiles that assist with investigations and serve as evidence to help clear cases. With a diagnosis of the environmental attractors of illegal behavior, RTM can make very accurate forecasts of new crime locations, even if crime never occurred there before. Time and again, as little as 1% of the highest risk places that are identified in a jurisdiction 
have accounted for well over 40% of the crimes that were not prevented. And when crimes displace, they tend to emerge in other risky places, as expected. The forecasted places become the focus for crime prevention. This is because RTM makes, consist uh, because RTM makes consistently accurate forecasts. These high-risk places are the target areas for these prevention efforts, such as directed patrols or other stakeholder engagements. With regard to patrols by police, every patrol officer gets a map showing the priority places that are specific to their coverage area. They also get instructions on what risky features to focus on and what actions to take at these locations. Police still patrol all parts of the city. They investigate crimes and they clear cases. They just give a little extra attention to the risky places. Actionable intel comes from both the risk train maps and the tables. Tables show crime attractors, which help commanders decide what factors to focus on that truly correlate with criminal behavior, such as convenience stores or rooming houses. And the relative risk values allow comparisons across risk factors to help prioritize mitigation efforts. We can also see how risk factors influence behavior and the extent of this spatial influence. For example, we might have assumed that parking lots relate to robbery, but it's not proximity to any parking lot that heightens risk. It's only areas with high concentrations of parking lots that attract robbery incidents most of the time and therefore pose more than three and a half times greater risk of robbery than elsewhere in the town. We can also consider timing to, uh, to determine, for example, that schools or parking lots are only risky at certain times of the day in the same way that we might have assumed bars to be to have different spatial influences at 10 p.m. on a Friday compared to 10 a.m. on a Tuesday. The risk train maps and tables produce evidence that enables multiple local agencies to share the burden of crime prevention, to mobilize their resources, and to coordinate their efforts to reduce crime risks. For instance, while police focus patrols on high-risk places and do business checks at laundromats located there, they may also pay attention to nearby vacant properties at peak times. Meanwhile, the city planning department can prioritize their boarding up or demolition of vacant properties, and public works can fix the street lights at these priority locations. RTM is also used to geographically profile preferences, uh, offender preferences, to assist criminal investigations. Here's a map of burglary incident locations from March through May 2017 in Atlantic City. During this time, there was a burglary series that was identified in Districts 1 and 2. Detectives believed these burglaries to be connected to a pair of offenders. So they used risk train modeling to analyze the incidents and, the, and to profile the offender's spatial preferences to anticipate the next likely targets. When police do things like this, it allows detectives to prioritize surveillance and to catch offenders quickly. By May 10th, both of the suspects were arrested, were arrested due to the excellent police work of, of uh, the department. Um, but this map only shows, on this map here, it only shows the burglary incidents that occurred after their arrests. Needless to say, the police believe that they got the right people. But RTM also linked open cases to the suspect's spatial profiles. Police ran the risk train model on the burglary incidents that were thought to be connected to these offenders to geographically profile their burglary location preferences. Results showed that the offenders' cases were located in their preferred areas, shown here uh, in, in uh, red or orange. Um, and this would have been expected, but there was also a red area way outside in District 5, uh, in District 5, that had an unsolved burglary located in it. The investigation was reopened, and as it turns out, one of the suspects regularly slept in a house nearby. Now this burglary was connected to him too. 
These police use cases are part of a larger risk-based policing initiative currently underway in Atlantic City. With each new risk train model, they follow a process of creating risk narratives and developing risk reduction strategies accordingly. For example, risk train models for robberies and shootings, which the police believed to be closely tied to the drug trade, were identified as convenience stores, um, identified uh, factors which, such as convenience stores, laundromats, and vacant buildings as the top risk factors. The consensus around these results was that convenience stores are places that were easy to loiter, open late, and there was a lot of uh, traffic um, in and out. This allowed dealers to sell or solicit buyers. The nearby laundromats, which were usually coin operated, open late, and not regularly surveilled or managed by a, a human manager, uh, were places where they were told where the buyers were told to go to make the transactions and the nearby vacant buildings were used as stash houses for the dealers or for the buyers to go and use the drugs out of sight the risk reduction strategies that were employed in response to this type of risk narrative focused on disrupting the narrative in the first quarter of 2017 the Atlantic City Police Department and the City of Atlantic City have had month-to-month -month crime reductions, 22% fewer robberies, 20% fewer violent crimes overall compared to the same time last year. This particular project was led by the Police Department in partnership um, with Dr. Kennedy and Dr. Drave um, at Rutgers University. And this crime drop, which was really um, the work of the police intervening to disrupt this narrative um, coincides with the police department's intervention activities that were, that were specifically focused on the risky places in the city. Their efforts were actually highlighted in a recent National Geographic uh, TV series called Predicting the Future. So risk terrain modeling is the engine under the hood of the risk train modeling diagnostics software or rtmdx in just a few steps the software diagnoses how your data relates to features of the environment how these features interact and where they co-locate to attract certain types of behaviors resulting in the outcome events particular to your town state or region uh, the software is actually in a new iteration. Um, it's being updated as we speak. And this is, these are a few screenshots of the new version. Um, it's pretty easy and straightforward to use. Um, you can have multiple projects and multiple analyses. And within each analysis tab, you basically follow the wizard um, through the next, through a series of steps to enter your data and run an analysis. For example, to look at robbery in Atlantic City, you enter the robbery data in terms, uh, I'm sorry, you enter the uh, study area, in this case, the uh, police districts in Atlantic City, and then you click next. You, you uh, enter the units of analysis and your uh, units, uh, your um, multipliers, such as 308 feet, which represents the average block length in the city, and 154 feet, which is half of that, which represents the unit of analysis. This is the unit at which the forecasts are made, in this case, the equivalent of half a block. The analysis issue in this case is robbery, and we input the robbery data that we want to analyze as either a um, shape file, point shape file, CSV file, or even KML file. Um, and we can filter this data as we choose to by date, by time of day, or by any other attribute. Then we input the risk factor data. This is uh, more or less uh, features of the environment that we use to model the, the uh, geographic space, gas stations, hotels, laundromats, liquor stores, and so forth. We click next, we summarize the data, and then click run. Once the analysis is run, it presents results in the form of maps as well as tables. Um, the maps uh, and tables both provide 
information that could be used for forming risk narratives, as well as for deploying resources. Um, most of the data that's necessary for doing risk train modeling, um, should you choose to do it, you probably already have. And you probably already have the local expertise to then make use of these risk assessments. The software just helps you quickly analyze and synthesize these insights, although you also could do all of this manually, and resources for doing that are online as well. Um, in Texas, as kind of a final example uh, to this, uh, risk train modeling was used to identify risky places for child abuse. And then organizations that help child abuse victims and other abuse victims used the risk train maps to target social media ad buys and to put boots on the ground in high risk places to help potential victims get out of dangerous situations before the abuse occurs. The environmental contexts for crime or other hazards, whether they're in Texas or Atlantic City or Arizona, will vary across different cities and different crime types. You can think about this through the analogy of a kaleidoscope. The cylinder of the kaleidoscope represents the particular environment or study setting that we're interested in examining. The shards of glass represent crime attractors or features of that environment, such as bars, fast food restaurants, parks, or grocery stores. Moving from environment to environment represents a turn of the kaleidoscope. So the pieces come together in different configurations, each representing unique spatial and situational contexts that have implications for behavior at those places. We may know that crimes or other hazards uh, or hazardous incidents cluster spatially, but we can't assume that a standard response to these problems at these locations will yield similar successes. Behavior settings differ. So risk train modeling helps to tailor the interventions and the responses within your jurisdictions accordingly. The use of risk train modeling keeps problem solving efforts grounded and evidence based. It allows for better utilization of resources and also increased transparency. It can provide actionable insights for improving coordination among various agencies and practitioners for informing decisions about where to dedicate resources and direct strategies, and for justifying collaborative problem solving among, among many stakeholders, not just police. Simply stated, risk train modeling is a decision-making tool that, make, that meets the demands of risk governance in the 21st century. Now, I know I've mentioned crime a lot, but I know of risk train modeling being used for many other topics in the fields of urban planning, public health, medicine, transportation, environmental science, business, biology, national security, even maritime shipping. I find this impact truly fascinating and exciting to be a part of, and I really do appreciate and thank you for letting me share it with you. Can I answer any questions? Yes, thank you, Joel. We'll see um, if, um Anybody who's attending uh, will type in a, a question. Um, as, as we're waiting, I, I, I did have a, a quick question for you myself. I was wondering, um, talking about the potential risk factors and sort of that kaleidoscope, uh, how is there a standard number of risk factors that are just sort of, you know, like you were saying, parking lots, gas stations, liquor stores, laundromats? Is it just this automatic sort of, um, um, standard of risk factors that um, are can be utilized um, across different sites and locations and then um, because you know is there any way also to expand that or add if there's like for example I'm making this up but uh, like bike share locations like if it's not in there but you you see this crime at, at a location and then you're able to so somehow, you know, um, surmise that it's because that location is where a bike share is and there's lots of bike thefts or something. Um, can you add that as a uh, risk factor? Do you, um, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great okay. question. Yeah. Um, so the goal of the risk factors as inputs is to essentially model the landscape. 
Um, mm -hmm. So in, t in cities or towns that have bike share, um, this would be an important risk factor that would be something you would want to, uh, to have as okay. one of the features that might be attractive of illegal behavior. Um, we tend to have a kind of like a, a, a starter list or kind of a go-to list mm -hmm. of risk factors that we don't want to forget about when going from town to town or doing different analyses, but they're not all relevant for each town. For example, right. Ocean City, New Jersey is a dry town. They don't have liquor stores or bars, so we wouldn't use that data. Um, but other towns uh, that do, we would certainly use that, and we would also use bike share locations in the same way that we might use bus stops or ATM machines for one town but not another. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay. I don't see any questions. Jason, do you uh, see any questions in case they're going to you and not me? Let's see if Jason's there. He's on mute. Um, so while that person's writing the really good but longer question, <laughs> I will, um, you know, I'll say that, you know, risk train modeling when it started about nine years ago, um, mm -hmm. it was it was done manually. And I'm sure many of the attendees on this list, uh, many of you might have a statistical background or a GIS background or um, a practitioner background within the justice field. Um, and a lot of these, uh, this risk trade modeling analysis basically began by doing the analysis manually, um, using off-the-shelf software, running statistical analyses, using GIS, mm -hmm. um, and it required a variety of different skill sets to kind of produce the analytical results. The software has made this a bit easier and, and arguably less tedious, um, but all of these resources and kind of the engine under the hood is all available uh, for, um, for review uh, and scrutiny, which adds that level of transparency um, that mm -hmm. I just want to kind of reiterate. Okay, yeah, we do have a couple questions. And as we, we actually, before I forget as well, um, we may launch the poll too um, for those of you who are here. But um, while we're in the process of doing that, um, we do have a couple questions. So let me see, we have, um, other than policing, what other uses do you see? And then this might go uh, fit with the next question as well. That is, can you speak to crime types that you have seen with similar spatial attractors? Um, sure, let's start with the second question. Um, crime types with similar attractors. Um, we've, a lot of crimes that have been studied um, by me personally usually relate to either property or violent crimes. Um, property crimes tend to be somewhat distinct. You have theft from motor vehicle or motor vehicle theft, which um, could have uh, very different risk factors, although they both relate to cars. Um, burglary has also been studied, and a lot of these risk factors uh, tend to be things that you might not initially think of, such as proximity to schools um, or, um, uh, you know, if the common uh, assumption is, you know, parking lots or, or parking meters, um, you'd kind of be surprised that the um, risk factors tend to be uh, things along the lines of schools or shopping centers or malls, not specifically at them, but sometimes nearby, um, which are places that people drive as a destination to, but pass the um, particular targets, which increase the risk well beyond the immediate location of these facilities. Um, other risk factors, um, again, these are not generic risk factors. You really do need to model the patterns of crime within a particular jurisdiction. But things like robberies or shootings that relate to a drug trade um, could have similar risk factors, such as in Atlantic City, where convenience stores, rooming houses, and vacant properties kind of created this risk narrative, as well as um, attractive quality, especially where they co-located. Um, other, other things, re, uh, in addition to policing, um, we've seen it used with cancer research. Uh, we have seen it used with um, looking at piracy on the Earth's oceans. Um, we have uh, used it in epidemiological research. We've looked at disease outbreaks. Um, we have, um, 
you know, it's been used for um, child abuse and child maltreatment, as I mentioned, but there's also some researchers looking at suicide. Um, trying to think of a few other ones. Um, I've seen it used for pollution control, for um, traffic crashes, um, pedestrian, um, uh, uh, pedestrian crashes, you know, pedestrian, uh, mm. pedestrians being struck by motor vehicles as well. Um, those are the ones that come, come to mind off the top of my head. Hopefully it answered okay. the question. Great. Well, I, I there's one, one more question. Oh, sorry. No, I'm sorry. I saw one question. Maybe it's the one you were about to address. Um, this one is, how do you work with jurisdictions to pull and clean the data that is loaded into RTM? Um, well, increasingly, uh, risk train modeling and the RTMDX software has been used by a number of practitioners that I'm not involved with at all. Mm -hmm. um, but um, we, when I do work with agencies or when agencies ask me for my advice or opinion, I usually suggest that they begin with thinking about the problem issue that they want to address. Obviously, the risk factors for um, uh, for cancer or disease uh, research could be very different than risk factors for bicycle theft or, um, or robberies. But even robberies and shootings could have potentially different risk factors. So once they identify the problem issue that they want to focus on, um, then the process is usually a matter of uh, doing a basic literature review, um, whether they have, you know, uh, university researchers can certainly access uh, libraries and databases of journal articles, but in, it's increasingly easier to do it without that kind of access with Google Scholar and, um, you know, think tanks and kind of reputable um, research uh, entities out there like um, uh, crimesolutions.gov or the Campbell Collaborative or uh, other uh, research or uh, areas that have white papers that are available to kind of get a sense of what risk factors might relate to your problem of interest. Um, once you have a general idea of what risk factors you want, then you collect the data that relates to it. And most of this data is publicly available. You know, locations of bars and liquor stores and fast food restaurants and pawn shops, these are all public record. If they're not available um, through your immediate connections or relationships with other government agencies, some cities have them on uh, public data portals or GIS data clearinghouses. Um, and all of them are usually um, public records, so they could be uh, obtained through FOIA requests. Um, and that's really the only data that's needed, either the outcome event, uh, such as crime incident locations, or uh, risk factor data, which is usually business or retail infrastructure and usually readily obtainable. Great. So there are a few more questions popped up. Um, one is, uh, how frequently is the model validated? Does validation occur across different applications? Uh, good question. So um, a lot of cities we encourage, or a lot of uh, people using it, we kind of encourage them to do their first model or kind of practice uh, with by using a year's worth of data. A year's worth of data will kind of uh, produce a forecast of essentially a year's worth of risk for this uh, for the next subsequent year. And generally speaking, that will doing so will kind of control or look for general generalities. Uh, in, with regard to risky places while controlling for seasonality or other, other variations. Mm -hmm. On a more um, tactical or strategic basis, such as in Atlantic City, where they're using it to deploy police patrols, um, they redo the model monthly, and that allows them to kind of stay ahead of uh, the changing patterns of crime, which um, is, is worth noting that these patterns should change and are expected to change because the intervention strategies are expected to have an impact. And where there's an expectation of an impact um, for deterring crime at the high-risk locations, we would expect the patterns of crime to change in response. So they repeat monthly, and that kind of allows them to kind of stay ahead of the problem. Okay. Um, two related questions. Uh, one is, has any uh, RTM been used for sex offenses? And then the related question is, have you found that sex offenses do not occur in the neighbor of, um, I guess maybe in the neighborhood of schools? This is neighbor, but I think that meant, uh, probably meant neighborhood of schools. 
It's a good question. I, I've actually received that question a couple times um, over um, over the recent uh, past. I have not studied sex offenses directly with risk chain modeling, but I do know that there's a few published um, or a few researchers who have looked at it. Um, I, I don't know who they are or where they are off the top of my head, but I can try to track the ones down that I'm thinking of. Um, and I, I believe that sex offenses, need, you know, in this case, they would need to be looked at, um, you know, by type. You, you can have a variety of different sex offenses beyond the, tradi you know, the kind of in the traditional or um, um, uh, kind of assumed kind of street crime, but a number of different sex offenses ranging from domestic violence all the way down to offenses uh, among strangers on the street um, to date rape or, or on college campuses, all of which could have their own environmental um, attractors um, and make some places riskier than others. So I don't have any firsthand experience of studying it, but I do know that other other people have looked into it. And if um, if you'd like to email me, I'd be happy to follow up with that information if I could find it. Great. Um, and one more question. Do you see this as being a partner with things like the traditional hotspot policing? Since it seems like that um, might help us to identify initial areas in which an analysis would be needed. Yes, absolutely. Uh, in fact, um, we've, we've done some research to show that the, some of the best forecasts actually come from a combination of high risk locations and hot uh, and hotspots, essentially. That is, hotspots tell you where crime is happening now, but it, it, um, it also assumes that it's, it's not going to move. And what we know is that crime does move, and it does move, and the patterns of crime do change, especially in response to successful intervention strategies. So if you use risk trade modeling in combination with other uh, methodologies, such as hotspots, it allows you to focus on the areas that are of greatest risk now and also anticipate the areas of greatest risk where crime might emerge or displace. And um, the, you know, one way to think of it is basically um, hotspots show general, you know, places where people generally commit crime over and over again. If the highest risk locations also exist in these locations, then you focus on the high risk areas within the hotspots and you'll have the best predictive validity. Um, essentially, risk train modeling diagnoses the underlying attractors of hotspots and then finds other similar places where it's likely to emerge as well. So the interaction of hotspots and high-risk places has very good predictive validity. And we, we've written on this, and, um, and I would certainly encourage it. Great. Thank you. I think there's one more question. Uh, what are your strategies for getting administrative buy-in? That's a good question. I should probably <laughs> ask everybody on this list. Um, you know, it varies. It really depends who the stakeholders are. Um, I think it's fair to say that, um, you know, um, policing practices are often embedded um, in perceptions of, of uh, officers who have been there for a long period of time and believe that they understand the problem and, and uh, understand the way that they should be addressing it. Um, there, um, you know, a variety of stakeholders are usually um, going to receive this uh, differently. You know, for example, um, planning departments, you know, find a lot of value in it and usually buy in quite quickly because, you know, of the, say, 5,000 or 500 or even 20 uh, vacant properties or abandoned properties that they have in their city, but they only have very limited resources, rather than randomly selecting one to focus on at the, any given moment in time, it allows them to prioritize their efforts and also empirically support the actions that they're taking, which otherwise could seem arbitrary. Um, it's a complicated question, and I don't really have a simple answer other than um, offering to demonstrate how it works and demonstrating that there's predictive validity, but also more importantly, that the results from the analysis, the output from the analysis, really can have, really can be actionable and useful for decision-making uh, processes. And that in many ways, it supports what they want to do, but gives them an empirical basis for doing it, as well as for prioritizing resources. Uh, from a policing perspective, 
It also gives them an ability to measure their success and get credit for crime not occurring, which tends to be the opposite of traditional measures of police performance, such as stops, arrests, or citations, which kind of demand that crime happen first, which necessitate the citation, the stop, or the arrest. But risk train modeling allows for kind of pre-post testing for actions intended to reduce risk and ultimately reduce crime, while also assigning credit for that, for that effort. Um, depending upon who you're talking to, a number of these things, um, whether it's multi-stakeholder engagement, evidence-based deployment of resources, new measures of performance, or simply a pilot project to show that the forecasting is accurate and if they go to these places, they're more likely to be efficiently utilizing resources. All could be ways to, um, to encourage buy-in. Great, thank you. Um, I was wondering um, if you could provide your email address if anybody had any additional questions or were uh, particularly interested and wanted to follow up regarding the uh, sex offend uh, offenses um, issue that we were speaking about. Do you have um, an email at Rutgers that people might be able to reach out to you? I don't believe we usually have email um, listed on, with our webinars. I, I just sent um, my personal email to all of the participants hopefully you received. Oh, wow. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Oh, there it is. I see it. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think uh, that was our last question. So again, I want to thank Joel uh, as well as everyone in the audience for joining us today. We hope that you enjoyed the presentation, and if you obviously have any questions, you can follow up with Joel. You can also reach out to us at JRSA for any questions that you may have regarding webinars, and uh, keep an eye out for future webinars, and uh, thank you. So thank you, Joel. Thank you very much, Erin. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Take care.